As we enter our fourth and final edition of the arcade experience at home, we take a look at some of the arcade conversions that made their way onto fifth generation consoles, or what is commonly referred to as the 32-bit era. It was here where many two-dimensional ports became virtually indistinguishable from one another, and we saw a big uptick in the number of Polygon games released. We had the expected hardware entries from Sega, Sony, and Nintendo, but also some wild cards from Atari and Panasonic. This particular time in gaming was exciting for a few reasons. Polygons were introducing new kinds of games we had never played before, while 2D games were looking just about as good as they possibly could. In many instances, we had never seen arcade games at home that were of this quality, this frequent, across all the major platforms. While the 16-bit systems had some stunners of their own, damn near everything here was on a completely different level of sound and visuals. In this episode, our journey will go across the 3DO all the way to the Nintendo 64 and cover some incredible home conversions. Hope you guys enjoy the arcade experience at home, part 4. The fifth generation really started for me with the 3DO. It was here that I got some of my first arcade ports that truly blew me the hell away. Some of those Laserdisc games from the 1980s showed up here in incredible form. Dragon's Lair had never looked so good, and the Mad Dog McCree light gun games were here as well. Fighting games made a heck of a showing on the 3DO. Primal Rage was here and far better than the other ports on the 16-bit home systems. The color and detail really stood out. The Neo Geo Fighter Samurai Showdown showed up too, and side by side, it was nothing short of amazing that it looked so similar. It was the first time I had access to a Neo Geo game that was this close to the original. Namco Starblade brought some spectacular polygon action home that was in many ways better looking than the arcade original. Think of it as a spaceship version of Panzer Dragoon. When Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo was released, the 3DO finally came into its own. It was one of the better home versions of the Street Fighter 2 games at its release and really showed that the 3DO was no slouch replicating the more powerful arcade platforms. The truth was, none of these games were perfect. They all had their issues with missing content and cutbacks, but they all still represented the arcade versions as well, or better than anything I had seen before. I had always felt that had the 3DO gotten a port of Mortal Kombat in 1993 when it launched, it would have sold much better, especially once the price drops hit. The platform will be remembered more for its original games, but I still enjoyed its arcade conversions quite a bit. Of course, everything changed in 1994 when I received my Japanese Sega Saturn. Not only was the Saturn considerably more powerful than the 3DO, but it was also going to get many more games. While the arcade ports from Sega started right off the bat, it took a while for the two-dimensional games to really get going. Some of the first arcade ports to hit the machine were shoot-'em-ups. We got a few parodious titles in one compilation that were pretty much spot-on perfect. I mean, outside of some variance in resolution and sound, this was exactly what I had been hoping for from the fifth generation. They were some very solid games too. They are basically the second and third entries in the Parodius line, a series of games that were cuter versions of Konami's Gradius. It set the stage for a coming flood of the genre's best, including Layer Section, or what had been known as Ray Force in the arcade. This was a vertically scrolling shooter from Taito where you could fight both enemies in the background and those that were right in front of you. Again, the Saturn makes arcade ports look easy, replicating the sprites and backgrounds at a level I had only dreamed of in previous generations. Gorgeous graphics, kick-ass music, and gameplay that never misses a beat. Another Taito winner, Darius Guyton, was on Saturn, and to no surprise at all, it was excellent as well. Hell, if I showed this to 100 people, 99 wouldn't be able to tell it apart from the arcade. It was that close. It was also one of the first games that put to rest the notion the Saturn could not do transparencies, because they are everywhere in this game, just like the arcade. Of course, many more shooters would follow, and many more would be killer versions of their arcade counterparts. 
Sometimes you got some differences in sound, and sometimes you got some changes in the resolution that affected the way the sprites and backgrounds looked. But honestly, the Saturn did a bang up job on the vast majority of them. The Saturn may have been taking a beating in the press early for its three-dimensional performance, but nobody could say a damn word about its growing library of killer two-dimensional shoot-'em-ups. It would take a bit longer for arcade fighting games to show up, but they made just as much noise as the shoot 'em ups we just covered. X Men Children of the Atom was the first big 2D arcade fighter on the Saturn, and it was a doozy. While it did see some cuts to animation thanks to the CD ROM technology in the Saturn, the visuals themselves were every bit as impressive. Side by side, the fighters and the backgrounds lose nothing in the move to a home system. They are just as large, just as colorful, and just as detailed. My friend and I imported this when it launched and sat in stunned amazement when we first dropped it in the Saturn. Then came Capcom's new entry into the Street Fighter series called Zero in Japan and Alpha in the US and Europe. I had loved this game in the arcade, so I had been really looking forward to the home version, and the Saturn did not disappoint. It was the kind of close to the arcade I had been wanting for 15 years at that point, and I damn near cried tears of joy, it was so damn good. Capcom wasn't done, oh no, because we got Vampire Hunter, the second entry into the Darkstalker series of fighting games. Again, minus some missing animations, this thing was so close I just couldn't believe it. Saturn had taken three of Capcom's biggest arcade titles at that point, and effortlessly brought them home at a level that had trumped everything the previous 20 years. The Saturn controller proved to work with these games incredibly well, not just because of its six-button face, but also because of the perfectly balanced directional pad. Getting fireball and uppercut motions off had never been so easy, so not only were these games visually stunning, but they played just as good. These early releases made it clear Saturn was a force to be reckoned with if you enjoyed fighting games, and they made the console worth owning all by themselves. Sprite scaling games had a long history of disappointing home ports. Most were butchered in the 8 and 16 bit eras. Every so often we got one worth talking about, but for the most part it was a sad list that let me down again and again. When Saturn showed up, I was praying that would change. I mean, surely a machine made more than a decade after the technology first showed up would mean perfect ports, right? Well, yes and no. Some games really shined on the Saturn. Afterburner 2 was a really good translation. It was smooth, had loads on screen, and was just as fast and as playable as the original. Space Harrier was a good one too. Again, smooth, fast, and immensely playable, it did the arcade proud. Outrun was actually better than the arcade. It had all the content plus some new music and a new hyper-smooth graphics option that made it look so much faster and fluid. It was the best home version of this game for a very long time. Taito games got in on the sprite scaling releases as well. Night Striker S was a visually stunning port of the 1989 arcade. I really enjoyed this one and think it more than proved the Saturn was capable of doing these games justice. I mean, take a moment and consider what you're seeing here. Had any machine before the Saturn done a game like this at this level? Chase HQ plus SCI was a port of the first two games in that series. I always thought it did a very decent job of recreating the graphics, but some folks don't like how it plays. I personally enjoyed it well enough, however. Things got a bit murky when it came to some of the other sprite scalers on the Saturn. Games like Galaxy Force 2 weren't done by the same developer that did OutRun, and the conversion was really lacking. Its main issue was the choppy performance, which is surprising considering a game like Night Striker S was so much better. 
The arcade racer Power Drift was on Saturn, and while the conversion was better than Galaxy Force 2, it still runs at half the arcade's frame rate. Like many releases, the quality of these games were intricately tied to who developed them. Some devs simply could do it better. As the Saturn matured and more games were released, we really started to see some freaking a releases of some of the best arcade games ever created. The follow-up to the original, Elevator Action Returns, was a run-and-gun with a twist. You must fight your way through different environments that range from buildings, to warehouses, to jumbo jets. The sprites are small, but don't be fooled into thinking that means the action isn't intense. The animation is worth playing it for alone. HyperDuel's Saturn port isn't just the only conversion you could play at the time, but was also upgraded to be even better than the original arcade. Tons of sprites, detailed backgrounds, and the gameplay is as spot on as you could want it. Salamander Deluxe Pack brought that series to the Saturn in fine form. This one had not just Salamander and Life Force, but the relatively new Salamander 2 as well. It showed that not only could the Saturn port older arcade shoot em ups perfectly, but newer ones as well and the ports just kept coming. Capcom released an entire line of generation compilations that featured many of their best arcade games, many looking and playing quite well on the Saturn. More shoot-em-ups and fighting games made their way out, keeping those of us willing to import games well-stocked with new stuff to play every week. The US saw a few of them, but the vast majority were unfortunately released in Japan only. As nice as 2D Saturn games had been, everything was taken up a notch with the release of the expanded RAM cartridges. These add-ons were sold separately and packed in with certain games, and added more memory to the Saturn's pool of RAM, meaning things like sound and animation would need less cuts in the games that supported them. Things started well enough with the 1 megabyte version. Capcom games like Cyberbots used it quite effectively. It added a level of polish above what we had already seen. Neo Geo ports made use of the cartridge quite a bit, which included some real winners like Metal Slug. While still not 100% perfect, its quality was well above the Neo Geo ports we had received on the Genesis and Super Nintendo. When it came to detail, amount of stuff on the screen, and the size of your enemies, it really held its own. Samurai Showdown 4 uses the RAM expansion to some fine results as well. Again, the size of the fighters, the backgrounds, the color, the Saturn really did well painting a picture that was nearly indistinguishable from the arcade. But as good as these games were, the 1 megabyte expansion could only do so much. The Saturn was still a CD-ROM based device and things needed to be cut or modified for these conversions. Sega recognized that it needed more, so they created the 4 megabyte extended RAM cartridge, inviting ports from the latest and greatest two-dimensional fighters. Right away things kicked off with a blast thanks to X-Men vs Street Fighter, Capcom's tag team fighter that would have been impossible without the cartridge. It had four individual fighters that could be changed at will anytime you wanted. The arcade had been a beauty and released only a year prior. Having this on Saturn at this level was nothing short of spectacular. It easily put the awful PlayStation release to shame. Vampire Savior used the 4 megabyte expansion as well, and again the results were impressive. You wanted arcade goodness? Well here it was and no other system could do it the same level of justice. Even Street Fighter Zero 3 came to the Saturn using the upgrade. It was super late in the platform's life, and sort of a thank you from Capcom for buying all their games. I still consider it the best port of this title released for any platform. 
上流拳行くぜ<笑>Unfortunately, most third parties had a much harder time with Saturn's polygon performance than Sega did. It was a fact that dominated the system's narrative throughout its life. Most games that were shared between the Saturn and PlayStation almost always turned out better on the latter. The real killer in this regard was that many third parties didn't even try to port their games. Namco announced Saturn's support early and even began work on CyberSled, but bowed out when they ran into issues getting the engine up and running and had so much more success on the competition's hardware. 
The sad reality was that Saturn simply didn't have the sales potential worldwide for studios and publishers to invest the resources to make their games for it. When someone did show up with an arcade port using polygons, it was often well below expectations. Like the Mega Drive before it, Sega prepared an arcade version of the Saturn called the STV Titan. This was driven by much of the same tech that was in the Saturn, but used ROM cartridges instead of the CD format. Believe it or not, this thing was loaded with releases, totaling nearly 70 unique arcade games. Many of these would end up being some of the better games on the Saturn. The cotton shoot-'em-ups on the Saturn originated here. They showed off some great backgrounds, sprites, and special effects you didn't see often in games of the time. Decathlete, the multiplayer track and field sensation, used the same mode that had made Virtua Fighter 2 so visually pleasing, still running at a buttery smooth frame rate. The killer aerial-based combat game Astra Superstars came to this, with all its impressive animation and flashy special effects. And you can't forget about Die Hard Arcade, the beat-em-up loosely based on the popular movie. The genre had taken a backseat during that generation, but this one turned out just fine. Despite the popular thinking that all the games for the STV Titan were perfectly ported to the Saturn, this is not true. Because these two platforms used different storage methods, the STV Titan versions often had more animation and a larger variety of sound effects. Games like Golden Axe The Duel have noticeable animation cuts when viewed side by side. Of course, there is no conversation about that era that does not include the Sony PlayStation. There is no amount of time I can give it in this video to do its library justice. Over 4,000 games were released for this platform. The thing that many people don't realize is that the Saturn's better games, including the two-dimensional releases, were on the PlayStation. While the rest of the world was basking in the new light of 3D polygons, Japan kept the 2D games coming. While Saturn was getting all those shoot 'em ups and fighting games, the PlayStation was getting them as well. And the thing is, they were damn good ports themselves. It's easy to disparage the shortcomings, but many of these games were perfectly fine on the PlayStation. The PlayStation did the Street Fighter Alpha games all kinds of justice. Shoot 'em ups like Don Patchy are considered better on the PlayStation, and its sequel was a damn fine port as well. And perhaps most important of all, the platform had its own exclusive two dimensional games you couldn't play anywhere else. While the Saturn was special in its own right, the PlayStation provided me with endless alternatives and exclusives to fill any downtime in between Saturn releases. Would I rather play X-Men vs. Street Fighter on the Saturn? Absolutely, but outside of RAM expansion games, the PlayStation often was no slouch at 2D games and many were just as playable. In fact, it was a 2D game that got me interested in the platform in the first place. Of course, the arcade at home took on another meaning during this system's run. Many of its biggest hits were done on PlayStation-based arcade technology, and when they came home, they often had more content. The Tekken series started here, and the first two home versions were one-to-one -one perfection. Namco also managed some killer ports of their other arcade games like Time Crisis and Ridge Racer, proving that the design of the PlayStation was powerful enough to do a damn good job porting games from other arcade platforms. While the Saturn was my preferred system, I played my PlayStation just as much and enjoyed new games long after Sega put the Saturn and Dreamcast out to pasture. Should you be one to thumb your nose up at the 2D games for this system thinking they aren't worth your time, I highly advise you reconsider. It's well known that 3D games were solid here, but you might be missing a treasure trove of 2D content as well. 
thing I appreciated about the Nintendo 64 at the time was that its arcade ports were often radically different than the games released on the Saturn. Right off the bat, I enjoyed the Cruising USA series. Yeah, it was simple as hell, but I really liked the OutRun style setup where your joy of driving was the main reason you played it. None of them were arcade perfect, but they were close enough to have a good time with. There were also many more midway ports like Gauntlet Legends. It was a 3D update to the classic dungeon crawler. It had four player support and was a blast to play with your friends. Hydro Thunder made a showing that was worth playing and a few Mortal Kombat games showed up too. I also adored the arcade sports titles it received. NBA Hang Time was the best home version of that game released and I lost many a hour in its excellent gameplay. NFL Blitz was a winner as well. It ran so good and looked so close to the arcade while retaining that killer fun factor. And tons more Midway ports showed up. There were Rampage releases, some crappy 3D fighters, and even the Rush game showed up to the party. Truth be told, the Nintendo 64's tiny library didn't have many arcade ports that weren't in some way tied to Midway in some form. I didn't mind that though. Nintendo's platform often had a distinctive look and feel that was quite unique when compared to what was received elsewhere. I won't blow smoke up your ass though, many of these games have aged far worse than Saturn games. The blurry textures can be a real eyesore. Luckily, its exclusives picked up the slack and made the Nintendo 64 one of my favorite machines ever. Some of you may be wondering, why stop here? Why not keep going with a part 5 and 6? Honestly, home ports of arcade games really began to lose their luster after the 5th generation for me. The Dreamcast home system and the Naomi Arcade platform had been developed as to allow games to transition seamlessly, so you pretty much knew what you were getting. There really were no surprises there. There were only a handful of Sega Model 3 games ported to the home systems, and by the time the Xbox and PlayStation 2 had shown up, arcades were disappearing at an alarming rate. The great arcade manufacturers had turned almost completely to home consoles for their games, and most arcade platforms were either based on those consoles or some variant of PC hardware. As time went on, the remaining arcades began to morph into ticket-based mini-games that had little to do with the games of yore. It was really sad to see the once mighty technological showpieces in the arcade relegated to games that honestly were little more than generic time-based affairs with virtually no style or substance. When you walk into an arcade today, most of the games there look like they belong on your telephone. In a way, the arcade had been victimized by the very technology that had propped it up for so many years. Once home graphics hardware had gotten to the point where it could do similar levels of quality and became affordable, the only alternative for the arcade was to stay way out in front and cutting edge, a perilous proposition for the developers involved. One failed arcade game could have meant the end of the entire company. With arcades coming to an end, high-end PC graphics cards have sort of replaced them as the de facto gaming option. If you want the best a game can look and run, that's pretty much where you need to be. Of course, I still miss the days where dropping a quarter into a machine at the local 7-Eleven could allow you a few minutes of pure spectacle that simply could not be equaled at home. It was a part of my youth I revisit often, my memory still fresh with the family and friends that surrounded me. Many of them are no longer with me, but like the games we all enjoy together, they live on in our nostalgia-laden dreams of good times past. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.